Today I want to talk about transference. Uh, I'm not going to include the concept of counter-transference. Um, many people believe that counter-transference is really just transference. It's the analyst's transference to the patient. Um, and if that's so, then it's already covered under the concept of transference. Um, in future I may think differently about this and um, do a talk on counter-transference, but today I want to focus simply on transference and the different types of transference and the different conceptualizations of what transference is. So, uh, starting with Freud, um, for Freud, transference is a form of displacement or substitution. That is, feelings that one had originally in connection with a person from one's past, father, mother, a sibling, uh, those feelings are displaced onto a person in the present. Uh, and therefore, that person in the present comes to be a substitute for that past person. Um, this is essentially metaphor, uh, because metaphor is exactly that. It's a displacement, a substitution, and it's a, a substitution based on some point of similarity between the two objects or the two people who are being identified. Uh, so in a father transference, the patient comes into therapy and over time begins uh, to feel that the analyst is somehow like his father. Um, so that's that can be a positive or a negative transference depending on whether the feelings are predominantly positive or predominantly negative. The feelings that are being transferred from father in the past onto analyst in the present. And of course transference applies outside of analysis, not just in analysis. So our daily lives are full of transferences, uh, positive, negative, ambivalent both, positive and negative. Um, so in the situation I described, the patient is feeling towards the analyst feelings that originated in feelings that he had towards his father, and so the analyst is becoming something of a substitute or a metaphorical father. Uh, his feelings are as if Provided the transference is a neurotic transference on the neurotic uh, level, in Kleinian terms, provided that the patient is operating in what Klein called the more advanced depressive or reparative position, the as if element is retained. That is, uh, the transference is what Hannah Siegel distinguished as a symbolic representation as opposed to a symbolic equation. On some level the patient is not equating the analyst with the father, certainly not literally. Um, it's more like a simile or a live metaphor. The patient is aware that it is as if uh, the analyst is his father. Um, it's not uh, a literalization. It's not what Siegel called a symbolic equation. Patients who are more disturbed, who are on the narcissistic borderline psychotic spectrum, that is who are operating in what Melanie Klein called the paranoid schizoid position, uh, sometimes then we have symbolic equation. The transference becomes concretized, it becomes literalized, and uh, it's as if the patient at times forgets that the analyst is only like the father, but the patient becomes on some level rather convinced that um, the analyst is identical to the father in a lot of ways. Uh, so 
that's an important distinction uh, on what level of mental functioning is the transference uh, uh, occurring. Uh, we can use Freud's terms instead of Melanie Klein's. We can say that when secondary process thinking uh, re remains dominant and the patient is not psychotic, um, then the as-if element of symbolic representation is retained. But if the patient moves more into primary process thinking, that's where we have the literalization and the concretization, the loss of the as-if element, and uh, we have essentially a psychotic transference, a symbolic equation. Okay, um, for Freud, therefore, transference always um, uh, contained uh, um, an element of distortion. After all, the person in the present is not the person from the past, and so starting to feel that the analyst is your father, uh, starting to take up the role of a son, a child, a boy, in relation to, say, the male analyst as one's father, or taking up the position of a child, feeling like a child in relation to uh, the analyst as one's mother, father transference, mother transference, sibling transference. Um, Freud was certainly well aware of sibling transferences and he was certainly aware of sibling rivalry and of the transference of rivalrous feelings from past to present. Um, but uh, uh, subsequently in his own work and in that of later analysts, the role of the sibling transferences was kind of lost sight of and psychoanalysis came to be pretty much focused on parent-child. Um, more recently uh, we have remembered the important role of siblings uh, and uh, the role of sibling transferences. Uh, Juliet Mitchell wrote a whole book called Siblings and other writers as well have reminded us. And in certain analyses I have conducted, the sibling transference was uh, as central, sometimes even more central, than transferences that arose from past relations with parent figures. In any case, Freud always um, emphasized the element of distortion in transference. Um, one is not perceiving the person in the present very you know, accurately. One is seeing them as if, and one may well be distorting, uh, if it's a father transference, their fatherly qualities. If it was a negative father transference because the father had been stern or uh, cruel um, or authoritarian, one may uh, see the authoritarian father in, say, a boss uh, who is not that authoritarian. One, one may even subtly provoke the boss to be authoritarian precisely because then he would fit the transference from the past onto the present. So there's this element of distortion. Um, and, and analysis was seen as correcting these distortions. I mean, if you become aware that you're in a transference of your authoritarian father onto every boss, and you're reacting in a resentful or rebellious way, um, this is good to know about oneself. One can take corrective steps. One can take another look at the boss and maybe realize he's not so authoritarian as you had been thinking, um, that you got triggered, and there was an element of distortion. Um, in subsequent years, uh, analysts started to um, emphasize that before one can really focus on the distortion in transference, one needs to, first of all, acknowledge the truth content. The boss may, in fact, have some traits, more or less, that, in fact, do resemble the father from the past. And uh, this element of truth needs to be acknowledged. And uh, once 
that has been acknowledged, one can then go on to help the patient look at the elements of distortion or of exaggeration, the, the patient's overreaction. Um, but it is really very important um, to acknowledge the element of the patient's reality testing that is accurate. Yes, um, the boss or the analyst sometimes actually really has behaved in a somewhat um, authoritarian or cruel uh, manner or domineering manner, perhaps. Um, and that must be acknowledged. Uh, but then the question is, okay, I did behave this way, rather like your father, but what have you, look what you made of this. Look what you did with this resemblance. Um, the patient may have made a mountain out of a molehill. You have to acknowledge the molehill, the accurate element, and then you can go on to discuss uh, the exaggeration, the distortion, the overreaction, perhaps. Uh, all of this leads to important insight uh, into how the patient is not letting the past be the past, but is recreating the past in the present and therefore not entirely living in the present. Uh, uh, this is important insight. It's an important part of the analytic process. Okay. Um, Freud and Freudians, uh, at least at the beginning, worked primarily with neurotic patients um, and therefore uh, his and his followers discussions of transference uh, were about the kinds of transferences one sees in neurotic patients. Now from a Kleinian point of view um, these are what Kleinians call whole object transferences. That is um, the object is seen as whole, both good and bad. These transferences come from a time when the patient has reached the so-called depressive or reparative position, has overcome splitting to some degree at least, and is tending to see both sides, good and bad, and is able to hold that tension without splitting. And um, so uh, these neurotic transferences are whole object transferences for the most part and uh, that's what we see in neurotics and therefore uh, these are transferences where the as if element is maintained to some degree as opposed to more psychotic transferences where the as if is lost. Um, this is an important distinction. Uh, let's take the distinction between the erotic transference and the erotized transference. The erotic transference is a neurotic transference. It's a whole object transference. The as if element is maintained, so the patient feels that he or she is in love with the analyst, but they know that um, there's something distorting about this, that there's something unreal about this, there's something as if about this, and uh, they don't have very much trouble maintaining boundaries, they're not getting off the couch, they're not stalking the analyst outside of the treatment, um, they're recognizing that this needs to be analyzed, um, and that it has an awful lot to do with their past. Uh, and uh, so these, these are analyzable erotic transferences, as distinct from the erotized transference, which tends to be produced by uh, borderline uh, or psychotic patients who are operating predominantly in the paranoid schizoid position. And uh, these are very intense, there is great pressure to act out. Um, the patient will propose uh, beginning an affair with the analyst or uh, ending the analysis and proceeding to marry uh, or the patient will show up 
uh, outside the office, uh, perhaps outside the analyst's home, perhaps peeking in the windows of the analyst's home. Uh, these can be quite dangerous, especially if it's a negative transference, uh, as opposed to an erotic one. Similarly, there are neurotic negative transferences where the, anal the patient feels quite hostile towards the analyst, um, linking him to some hated figure from the past. But that element of as if is retained, so the patient is not likely to act out. Whereas a very negative transference in someone who's operating on the paranoid schizoid level may well be acted out, and the patient may come to actually constitute a danger to the analyst. Um, there's the possibility of violence, there is the possibility of of harm being done because the patient has lost the as if element of the of the negative transference. Uh, okay, um, Klein Melanie Klein enables us to distinguish these whole object neurotic transferences from part object transferences. Um, the part object ta transferences stem from the paranoid schizoid position rather than the depressive or reparative position and splitting uh, is a predominant feature in PS, paranoid schizoid position and uh, in this position one sees things and people as all good or all bad one cannot hold ambivalence this is a pre-ambivalent position. And so the part object transferences are far less realistic. Um, the patient comes to see the analyst as an all bad figure, a devil perhaps, or an all good figure, a god, an idol, idolized. That's another important distinction. We get idealization in neurotic patients. Uh, a neurotic idealizing transference. Uh, the analyst is revered and uh, is uh, seen to have all kinds of wonderful qualities of wisdom and whatever. That's idealization. That's quite distinct from idolization which um, occurs when patients are operating in the paranoid schizoid position. That's a, a split transference. The analyst is not just idealized, but idolized, made into an all-good figure, or demonized, turned into an all-bad figure. These are part-object transferences. Um, okay, additionally, uh, Kleinian's um, uh, see transference as constituted not just by displacement but by projection. And there's a difference between Freudians and Kleinians here. When Freudians talk about transference they're mostly thinking about displacement, they're mostly thinking about whole object transferences. Um, whereas when Kleinians speak of transference, they may, may at times mean what the Freudians mean, but a lot of the time um, they're speaking of transferences not as displacements, but as projections. That is, the patient is mapping his internal world, projecting his internal world onto the external world, and so what he's projecting may be internal self-images, internal object images. Um, so the transference is a broader concept. It's not simply that one is seeing a person in the present as if he were a person from the past. He may be seeing a person in the present as himself, a projection of his self-image onto the person in the present. It might be a positive self-image, it might be a negative self-image, in other words, if he's hating someone in the present, uh, it may not be that he's displacing the image of a hated person from his past onto this present person. It may be that he's projecting a hated self-image 
an image of the self as all bad onto the person in the present. It may be more a matter of projection of self onto other rather than displacement of an image of another in the past onto a, per, uh, a, a person in the present. So in this way Kleinians have really very much broadened um, what they mean by transference uh, to include projection of the inner world, self and object images from the inner world onto the outer world. So when Kleinians talk about working in the transference, they're often meaning something far broader than working on the neurotic level, the Oedipal level, with uh, whole object displacements. They're talking about uh, working in addition with projections. Uh, of the inner world onto the outer world. So there's a real difference in, in, in what Freudians and Kleinians mean when they speak of the transference. Okay. So Freud, uh, Freud distinguished what he called the narcissistic neuroses from what he called the transference neuroses. The latter, the transference neuroses, are those in which um, the patient actually comes into treatment and forms what we call an object instinctual transference. That is, the patient falls in love with the analyst or falls in hate with the analyst. But almost from the get-go, uh, feelings towards the analyst um, emerge. The patient is no longer just talking about his troubles with his wife or girlfriend or husband or boyfriend. Uh, he's now talking about how he's feeling about the analyst. Um, and. Uh, the analysis of this transference uh, is central to the analytic process for Freud. I mean, for Freud, psychoanalysis is the analysis of transference. But there's this other category of patients that Freud um, considered the narcissistic neuroses, and these patients come into treatment and they do not form object instinctual transferences. Um, the analyst is waiting to be loved, hated, and to analyze what all of this means, and uh, it isn't happening. The patient is going on and on and on about themselves. They're going on and on about their problems in the external world, but they seem to be largely kind of indifferent to the analyst. Um, they seem to be using the analyst as something like a mirror, uh, but they're not really developing transference feelings towards the analyst. The analyst may be having trouble staying awake uh, because affect is what keeps us awake, and uh, no strong affect is being directed towards him or her. It's as if the analyst is sitting back, you know, thinking, what am I, chopped liver? I mean, this patient seems to be barely noticing that I'm here. Um, and the earlier generations of Freudian analysts tended to consider these patients unanalyzable because analysis is the analysis of transference feelings, and they didn't seem to be having any transference feelings, therefore not analyzable. Okay, here is the great contribution of Heinz Kohut, who realized that while there may be no object instinctual transferences, there still is transference, but of a fundamentally different sort that he called the self-object transferences. 
Now initially he printed that word self object as self hyphen object. Uh, but soon he came to eliminate the hyphen. He called it self object transferences and he he changed his definition of what this is. The first definition is that a self object is an object incompletely differentiated from the self. A loss of differentiation. And he spoke at this time of a merger transference where the boundary between self and object is blurred. And he spoke of narcissistic patients of uh, feeling towards and treating the analyst as almost a part of the self. Um, somehow expecting to have the same kind of control over the analyst as they would uh, a part of their own body or self. Uh, a loss of differentiation. Kohut quickly dropped this definition of self-object because he saw where the infant research was going. Uh, it was contradicting Freud's concept of primary narcissism as a phase of undifferentiation at the beginning. No I, not I. No self-other distinction for several months. Only gradually developing this distinction, this boundary. The infant research was supporting Melanie Klein, who argued that there was no such stage of primary narcissism. She was called an object relations thinker because she saw the baby having relations with objects, a self having relations with objects, from the very beginning. No primary narcissism, no phase of undifferentiation. So Kohut dropped the idea of the self object as an object incompletely differentiated. How then did he redefine it? He redefined it as an object from which the self seeks needed functions, like mirroring, like uh, being idealizable, uh, a soothing function, uh, a holding function, a containing function. Uh, the patient's fragmentation-prone self needs mirroring and idealizable uh, people, people who will mirror, people who will be idealizable. Um, he needs people who will provide the mirroring and the soothing that the child needs in order to form a cohesive self. So self-object, an object that provides needed functions for the self. Um, and Kohut went on to identify a range of different types of self-object transferences, beginning with the mirror transference, and he felt this comes from the phase of the early uh, infant-mother relationship. The mother is the mirroring self-object. Uh, um, the child uh, displays his growing capacities and mother is watching, mother is looking, mother is impressed. Look ma, no hands. Uh, he receives the approval and the admiration of the mother who mirrors his being and he begins to form a self uh, in the mirror held up by mother. Um, then there's the idealizing transference. If a father is around, he can turn to the father. And of course, if things don't work out properly with mother, then he um, is highly motivated to turn to the father to try to accomplish with the father what didn't work out with the mother. And he idealizes the father um, and tries to um, identify with the father's calmness and strength and capability and so he has this second chance uh, to firm up his sense of self not merely through mirroring by mother but now through identifying with this idealized father figure. Um, Kohut then went on to describe the alter ego or twinship 
transference um, in which one builds up one's sense of self through relatedness with someone similar, uh, possibly a sibling, possibly a close friend, um, uh, possibly a, a coach or a teacher, uh, but, but someone who uh, is like oneself in significant ways and through that connection the self can be firmed up. Then he went on to describe the adversarial uh, self-object transference. This is someone who one may disagree with and compete with but who, um, who, who helps one firm up a sense of self precisely by differentiating oneself from this person. In this uh, I am not like this person, I am different from this person in significant ways and uh, through this difference, through this differentiation, again, a sense of self is, is built up. Uh, later, some followers of Kohut went on to describe an abstract uh, self-object, perhaps like God. We know that some of the people in the camps were able to retain a sense of self despite all of the degradation they were subjected to because they firmly believed that no matter how degraded they uh, were forced to become, God still loved them. There was a loving God who saw them and, and loved them and to that extent they were able to sustain a sense of, of a good self despite all of the negative messages coming at them from, from their surrounding environment. An abstract self-object. It could be posterity. The artist, he takes his art around and everyone devalues it and says he's no good, but he firmly believes that one day posterity will recognize his genius and this idea of receiving self-object function, appreciation and admiration from a future audience keeps him carrying on with his painting. And of course, this might be delusion um, that, uh, that posthumous appreciation may never come, but who knows, uh, maybe it will come. And um, in any case, he derives self-object function from this idea of future appreciation. Okay, um, so here are these narcissistic patients who the Freudians thought were unanalyzable. They're now analyzable because analysis is the analysis of transference and while they don't produce object instinctual transferences, at least I would say in early stages of the treatment, um, they do produce these self-object transferences which can be analyzed and through the analysis of these the patient may progress to the point where he or she begins to produce object instinctual transferences that is they, they may become less narcissistic uh, they may uh, become more capable of object relating relating to separate objects um, and this of course is the goal of the treatment uh, I think this contribution by Heinz Kohut is uh, very important and, and fundamental, um, but of course the trouble is that his followers um, took this piece and pretended it was the whole and broke off relations with the Freudians and set up their own institutes and huge mistake. Kohut contributes an important piece that needs to be added on to the Freudian mansion. Um, uh, precisely to be able to understand how analysis of the self-object uh, transferences can lead to maturation and a lessening of the narcissism to the point where these patients can begin to be analyzed the way neurotics are analyzed. That is, they can come to uh, begin to deal with their Oedipus complex. Cohen himself saw this. Kohut himself saw this. It was some of his followers, more than him, uh, who uh, began to inflate the piece that he saw into the whole, which it was not. Okay. Um, 
the importance of working in the transference. Uh, James Strachey, uh, in his classic uh, paper on the therapeutic action of psychoanalysis, uh, argued that uh, it is only transference interpretations that are truly mutative. Uh, in analysis, we, we analyze the transferences that patients have to their spouses, their friends, their bosses, etc. Um, we analyze what's going on in the patient's life outside the analysis. But for Strachey, real change uh, is rather dependent on bringing the problems into the lab, as it were, and experiencing them live uh, towards the analyst and the interpretation of the transference that's going on between the patient and me right now in the consulting room, confronting the distortions involved in that, uh, understanding how that comes from the past, how it's a repetition, um, seeing it happening not just with your boss, but look, it's happening between you and me, right here and now. That, he argued, um, is the most likely to produce change. Now, there's a controversy about this. Uh, I myself um, disagree with Strachey. Um, uh, I think that a great deal of work, good work, goes on in analyzing transference and projection and other mechanisms in the patient's world uh, outside of the consulting room. I don't believe that only when it comes into the consulting room is change possible. I think that's that, that point of view is an exaggeration. Um, I'm not denying that when it does come in to the transference relationship, um, you know, then, then yes, it's 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 important. It's lively. We see it happening here and now. Um, this is good work in the transference, but it's not the only work that we do. Um, I want to mention the concept of the transference neurosis in Freudian theory. Transference is ubiquitous. We we have transferences uh, everywhere in our lives. Um, because we are always mapping present onto the past or the past onto the present. Um, uh, and of course, when the patient comes into analysis right from the beginning, these kinds of free floating transferences are going on and are usefully analyzed as such. But uh, at some point in the analysis, uh, and this varies from patient to patient. For some pa some patients, it's fairly soon. For other patients, it takes quite a while to develop the transference neurosis. The patient comes because of problems they're having with other people in their world, but at a certain point, the, it's as if the patient stops worrying about those external problems because now his problem is the analyst, his relationship with the analyst. This starts looming very large. It's as if the patient becomes a bit obsessed with the analysis and with the analyst. And the patient now begins to um, repeat uh, all of those problems from the past in the present with the analyst. And this is the transference neurosis. Now for Freud, this was essentially uh, a repetition with the analyst of the Oedipus complex. In other words, this does not come from the pre-Oedipal period, it comes from the Oedipal period um, and therefore it tends to be a whole object uh, transference that's going on. It's neurotic, uh, it's not borderline psychotic material. The concept of the transference neurosis is really a reliving of the Oedipus complex with the analyst. And therefore you only see it with neurotic patients. I mean, that's what Freud meant by it. Um, nowadays a lot of people use the concept much more loosely uh, to describe this bringing into the relationship with the analyst, not just of Oedipal material from the Oedipal phase, but 
pre-edipal material as well. Um, that is, and, and when that's the case, this quotes transference neurosis um, develops much more quickly and much more intensely because it's no longer coming just from the edipal phase. It's coming from the pre-edipal paranoid schizoid position um, and so with borderline and psychotic patients, patients functioning in PS, one might get an intense transference neurosis already developed in the first appointment. The patient might even begin to develop this so-called transference neurosis uh, when he or she first hears the analyst's uh, outgoing phone message. Um, it can happen very quickly. With neurotic patients, it happens much more gradually and is much more tame because it's coming from the later Oedipal period um, and it's less intense, although you know an Oedipal transference neurosis can be pretty intense, but it tends not to develop nearly as quickly as um, the so-called misnamed transference neurosis, but it's analogous to what happens with neurotics, but it happens much more intensely and much more quickly. Um, with pre edible patients. Um, so I, this is just a repeat of the distinction between the erotic transference and the erotized transference. Both may produce a, a so-called or something like a transference neurosis, um, but it develops much more quickly with the pre edible patients. Um, so mainstream classical Freudian psychoanalysis uh, has made, uh, considered um, working with the transference neurosis as the central uh, aspect of analysis. Um, and therefore encouraged its development. One of the reasons for the frequency of sessions, three, four, five times a week. Um, the use of the couch, um, the relatively dim lighting uh, in the room, um, all encourages a kind of regression um, and facilitates the emergence of this illusory phenomenon of the transference neurosis. Um, people hostile to psychoanalysis oppose this. They find it dangerous. And of course, it can be dangerous. It is playing with fire. Uh, but Freud justified this on the grounds that this is the only way to achieve deep personality change. You can, you can achieve cosmetic, superficial change in lots of ways, hypnosis and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, supportive psychotherapy. But if you want to really change character structure, then this kind of regression is necessary. And so psychoanalysis promotes the emergence of the transference neurosis um, and made, it, made the analysis of this the hallmark of, of analytic treatment. Um, so I had a colleague uh, who for many years was the only analyst in Calgary. Um, and uh, before he died, he sent me a paper he'd been working on for a number of years. Back when he was a candidate in Montreal, he almost got thrown out of uh, analytic training because he had a patient who uh, agreed to, woman patient, undertake analysis with him. And at the beginning, she said, so this is psychoanalysis. And does this mean I have to fall in love with you? And he said, no. And if you do, he said, I feel we have gone off, I will feel we've gone off the track somewhere. Well, the supervisors were outraged. You are blocking the development of the transference neurosis. Analysis is, the analysis of the transference neurosis, and you're, and you're heading it off at the pass. Um, well, you know, 30, 40 years later, um, he came to feel that he was right. I feel he was right. Um, now, when I say that, I don't mean that the development of the transference neurosis should be blocked off. Uh, I don't believe it should be blocked off. 
but neither do I believe it should be excessively invited, nor do I believe it should be excessively indulged. Um, too many women patients have spent too many years uh, worshipping at the feet of their idealized analysts when they uh, would be better off finding a partner and perhaps having children and sometimes they spend their childbearing years devoted to their idealized analyst uh, and essentially in love with him. Um, this, this is harmful and the analyst has the responsibility to discourage this um, precisely by analyzing it but also by pointing out how self-destructive it is, how essentially masochistic it is, uh, how it doesn't serve the purpose of growth, how it is regressive. Now not all analysts um, have dealt with it this way. Um, um, being worshipped uh, satisfies the analyst's narcissistic needs to be worshipped and so perhaps he indulges it and perhaps analytic theory allows him to indulge it excessively precisely by saying it's the be-all and end-all of truly psychoanalytic work. So this ties up with my earlier remarks about Strachey, I do not believe that only work in the transference, in the transference neurosis, uh, is mutative. I believe we do a great deal of good work analyzing the patient's struggles in the world outside the consulting room. Um, I don't believe patients need to develop this intense transference neurosis. Of course, in any analysis, feelings towards the analyst will come up and need to be talked about and need to be analyzed, but they certainly don't need to be encouraged or excessively indulged. Uh, and certainly, well, I mean, Freud distinguished between resistance to transference and transference resistance. I mean, transference for Freud initially was a resistance. Patient is hiring me because he has a problem, and I'm to help him analyze and solve the problem. But instead, he falls in love with me? What's the relevance of this? Uh, it, it, it can serve as a huge resistance to getting on with the work of the analysis. Subsequent psychoanalysts kind of got away from this idea of transference as a resistance and, and started seeing it a little bit more as the bread and butter of the work that we do. Um, and uh, that, that, that's a mistake. Um, the resistant nature of the transference neurosis, uh, neurosis needs to be kept in mind, in, in my opinion. Um, and should not be made the be-all and end-all of analytic work. The concept of transference, of course, was um, played a central role in Freud's theory of religion. Uh, for Freud, God is literally a transference onto the universe at large of the child's image of the Father. The classic definition of God is omnipotent, omniscient, and benevolent, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. And so here is the young child's image of his idealized and also his feared uh, father figure projected onto God, and God becomes therefore both uh, a fearful um, and stern and harsh critic, but also a loving and forgiving and helping figure. Uh, so here's the concept of God, pure transference, as far as Freud is concerned, uh, stemming from the part of the mind that indulges 
magical thinking, primary process as opposed to secondary process thinking. And as helpful and as soothing this God concept may be for some people, for Freud, it remains infantile and one ought to grow up and get past this and look at the world in a non-magical, uh, minimally transferential uh, way and, and, and face harsh reality. In my two books and in previous videos on God and on spirituality and on Winnicott, um, I've developed my thoughts in this area. Um, for me, spirituality is properly understood in terms of Winnicott's idea of transitional phenomenon and the transitional area, uh, just as the arts belong in this transitional area where we uh, attend a performance and we engage in a willing suspension of disbelief and we also engage in a willing suspension of belief. We're in this intermediate area where we no longer ask is this real or is this imaginary. This is what happens when we go to the movies and for me this is what happens when we attend a religious service. Uh, people ask do I believe in God or not. Uh, my answer is don't ask this question. Uh, let me enter the transitional object just as the parents shouldn't ask the child is the teddy bear real or imaginary? Is it alive or is it dead? Uh, don't ask me uh, when I'm going to the theater. Is what's happening real or illusion? Don't ask. You're going to spoil the performance for me and the same applies to liturgy. I enter the transitional area. Um, this is a much more sophisticated way of understanding uh, spiritual religious practices um, but of course many people take these practices uh, out of the transitional area and they make them quite literal and magical and uh, that is regressive, that is infantile, although it can sometimes save lives and it can sometimes help people cope in terrible circumstances. Um, but it is infantile from my point of view. Um, but I also see a problem with those who um, too extremely leave the transitional area in favor of saying, well, this is all simply myth, this is all simply metaphor. They may appreciate it as metaphor, but essentially they're saying it is just metaphor. And that leaves the transitional area in a different way. And uh, in any case, this is not the place to expand further on this. This argument is there in both of my books and in previous videos that I've, that I've done. Just to say here that for Freud, uh, religion is transference. Finally, <clears throat> let me address the question of uh, the place of transference in the cure. Uh, certainly traditional uh, psychoanalysts believe interpretation and insight into transference um, and projection um, plays an essential part in the cure in promoting self-understanding and the capacity for self-correction. Uh, when I catch myself quickly feeling hostile towards someone in authority, uh, I might be able to check myself. I may have learned from my analysis that uh, this may be a transference from my uh, authoritarian father and my uh, unresolved hostility towards him. And I may be able to uh, sense that I may be distorting things and I may take another look and I may be able to restrain um, my impulsive reaction and uh, certainly uh, that kind of insight, insight into my projections. <clears throat> I'm having a, an angry reaction at someone, um, not because I've 
transferred a figure from the past onto this person, but maybe because I've projected a hated self-image onto that person. He stands not for someone from my past, but he stands <clears throat> for a hated part of me. Insight into this um, helps me understand and, and enhances my self-control. Uh, so uh, all of this, uh, insight, self-knowledge, self-understanding uh, plays a, an essential part in the cure. But on the other hand, with the self-psychologists and the relational uh, uh, analysts, uh, I would say that positive transference uh, plays a very important role uh, in the cure. Uh, like negative transference, positive transference should be thoroughly analyzed. It is transference and needs to be understood as such, but finding a good object in one's analyst, testing him or her, uh, his or her passing of the tests, finding that analyst to be reliable, uh, honest, uh, a person of integrity, uh, a kind person who uh, wishes you well, um, finding that kind of good object and good empathic self-object uh, in your analyst, certainly in and of itself, is a curative factor. Now some of the relationalists and intersubjectivists and self-psychologists have taken this too far, essentially uh, playing down or denying altogether the role of interpretation and insight into distorting transference uh, playing that down and playing up the, the, the healing powers of, of empathy um, in and of itself. And um, I think they go over the top with that. Uh, I don't think uh, one is healed by encountering a good object or purely by internalizing a good object or transmuting internalization of the empathic self-object analyst. I don't believe that in, uh, in and of itself uh, can constitute a cure. I think it's necessary. I think it's insufficient. I think it needs to be supplemented, probably uh, to the tune of 50% of the cure constituting internalization of the good object, but also the other 50% being enhanced self-understanding, uh, mourning of um, illusions, uh, transcending uh, illusions, transcending wishful thinking, uh, insight into repetitions, um, the self-restraint that comes from understanding of one's repetitions. All of this uh, is also uh, an essential part of the cure. And so in emphasizing both of these things, uh, I'm being dialectical, um, and I'm refusing to be either a traditionalist, merely a traditionalist, or merely a relationalist. I'm attempting to be both at the same time, and I really think that that is what is necessary in order to uh, maximize the therapeutic power of psychoanalytic therapy. Okay. Uh, one final point before finishing. Uh, earlier, when um, I was discussing the issue of transference as distortion, um, I, I emphasized the distortion involved in seeing a person in the present as if they were a person from the past. But Melanie Klein helpfully draws our attention to another level of distortion. Uh, I may uh, transfer the image of my hostile authoritarian father onto my boss, thus distorting my perception of the boss, but my image of my father as hostile and uh, authoritarian may itself be distorted. That is, my father may not really have been that way, or nearly so much that way as uh, I have imagined. Um, 
in Freudian theory, we hear about castrating fathers, and fathers sometimes can certainly be uh, domineering and belittling and castrating, um, but sometimes uh, a child, a little boy, may see his father as castrating when, uh, in fact, he, the little boy, is castrating. That is, he may envy the power and strength and the masculinity uh, of his father, and he may wish to attack that, and he may wish to possess that and take it for himself. And these castrative wishes towards his father may be projected onto the father, and he may see the father as castrating when he's not, or far more castrating than he really is, due to uh, a projection of the boy's own castrative wishes onto the father. Now, this is not always the case, uh, but Klein helps us understand that um, when a patient presents us with an image of of their past. When they talk about their parents and the way their childhood was, this may involve a great deal of distortion. And for Kleinians, um, it is really important not to jump to conclusions early on in the analysis as to how the, patient, the, per, how the parents were. Uh, it's only at the end of analysis when a lot of distortion has been worked through because uh, the patient has formed various images of the analyst, and some of these may be quite distorted. And uh, so we analyze those distortions, and then it occurs to us that just as the patient has distorted his image of us, so he may have distorted his image of his parents. And so that, that early story of how the patients were may not be entirely true. It may be exaggerated, or it may be quite true. Um, it's very difficult for us to know, and we should not jump to conclusions. And I think this is one of the negative um, tendencies of self and relational theory, to often, uh, far too quickly, um, assume that the parents were bad, uh, and therefore to think that we uh, the analysts are going to be far better parents, and there's a grandiosity that's involved in that, um, and often a simple error involved in that, in that um, the, parent, the, the, the patient's story uh, may change radically over time. Patient comes in and says, mother was wonderful, father was terrible. Three years later, uh, father isn't looking so bad. Mother isn't looking so good. Um, things change over time. So it's very important not to be parent bashing too quickly uh, at, at the beginning uh, of the analysis. Um, so distortion can work two ways. I not only distort the person in the present by displacing an image of a past person, but the very image of the past person may itself involve distortion. This is an important uh, contribution of Kleinian theory, and of course this does not mean that the Kleinian analyst uh, doesn't believe at all in the importance of the real parenting. Um, the real parenting is crucially important, and for Klein the real parenting should be good parenting, because only taking in uh, the good uh, parent and the good analyst, only that can counteract uh, the bad. Uh, so the, the real parents are crucially important. The point is only that the child's uh, image of them may be distorted. Uh, we don't assume it's distorted. Uh, bad parents exist in the real world. Abusive uh, parents exist in the real world. And therefore, the story of abuse may well be perfectly accurate, but at other times it may not be so accurate. It sometimes uh, it, it may be quite exaggerated, quite distorted, uh, and sometimes it the distortion works in the other way. That is, the patient has images of wonderful parents, wonderful family life, 
And this may be a great distortion, uh, covering over elements of deficiency and parental uh, failure and outright abuse. Um, so you can't tell a book from its cover, um, and uh, it's only in the course of the analysis that one can begin uh, sometimes to get a sense of how things really were in childhood for the patient.